Dear guests and participants of the conference, I wish to welcome you to the second plenary talk. Um, I will just briefly read about the today's uh, presentation, today's talk, so that I can announce it. This is basically what is written on the website, but in case someone uh, hasn't read it yet, I will just briefly read it. In this presentation, the study of acquired language deficit will be used as an example to illustrate the importance that multidisciplinary research groups have gained in the past decades. The author will explain, explore the case of aphasia, which brings together, among others, neurologists, neuroradiologists, physiologists, psychologists, no, <laughs> speech, and language therapists and ling linguists, and benefits from the dialogue between clinical and university settings. I believe this will be very interesting because uh, our today's uh, presenter uh, is uh, Dr. Celia Martinez Ferreiro, who has been a guest lecturer at our faculty for a couple of years uh, before, for the previous couple of years. Five years! <laughs> has that been so long? <laughs> I remember uh, when I was a student, I also took some uh, lectures uh, with Sylvia, and it was very interesting. So I wish uh, you to enjoy uh, today's presentation. Uh, after the presentation we'll, uh, and after the talk, we will have an um, opportunity to ask questions, and I believe that there will be an interesting discussion, uh, mainly because I see that there are some students who are interested in this topic. Enjoy. <laughs> well, thank you very much for the presentation, uh, especially that side of the room knows that it is always a pleasure for me uh, to be back here, uh, because they always give me such a good time that I can not avoid keep on coming back. Today I'm going to talk about aphasia, I'm kind of obsessed with that, but I'm going to use a different perspective and I'm going to use aphasia as an excuse to show how interesting it is when the departments open a little bit and start sharing, start sharing human resources, start sharing technological uh, resources. And for that I'm going to uh, talk about aphasiology, but I guess the best way of doing it, especially when you talk to students that have all the future ahead, I'm so jealous, uh, is to do a little bit of history. And uh, most of you may not know that I actually started studying literature, Shakespearean drama, to be more precise. I see surprise faces. So that's why I selected uh, this uh, quote from Julius Caesar that I really, really love. There's a tide in the affair of men, which taken at the flow leads on to fortune. Amid it, all the, vo all the voyage of uh, their life is bound in shallows and in miseries. On such a full sea are we now afloat, and we must take the current that when it serves or lose our ventures. And my favorite parts are this, fortune, voyages and ventures, because it transmits the idea of really of like trouble and the idea of sharing that is behind a, a physiology. Maybe some of you can see the pictures. The first one is a poker game. Don't get very excited. It's not that working on a lab is very funny. It is actually Saturday and it is actually 10 at night. So we were close in the lab back then. But I wanted to show you the evolution and especially I wanted to show well, the picture over there, which is the whole entire reason why I did aphasia, that would be uh, my grandfather. He had aphasia after a stroke, and he was the first uh, reason why I started it, uh, this journey. So today I'm going to talk about aphasia with a little bit of background so that we all can see what aphasia is, or how to move from a library, from a traditional humanities study into a hospital. Then I'm going to address the multidisciplinary uh, enterprise it is by using one example of maybe the most collaborative of all the studies, which has to do with tumor resection in awake surgery, and or what we could say from the hayes sally methodology uh, to neuroimaging techniques. From that, hey sally can you say this in your language? To actually using all sorts of techniques in order to get a picture of what's going on in the brain. I'm going to talk about a lot to be done, but more than what you think that has already been done. And I took a selection of things that have been done here in Serbia on aphasia, so that you see that sometimes we really think that these studies are impossible, at least the very first steps of these studies are impossible. But there's a lot to be done with pen, paper, will, and the human force that moves all these uh, elements. So. I'll start with aphasia, and maybe the best definition or the best capture of what aphasia is comes uh, from this picture uh, from the Aphasia uh, National Association in the United States, where aphasia is seen as uh, your brain holding hostage all your words. It may be because you do not understand them anymore, or because you cannot produce them anymore, but it is something about your brain. 
Etymologically, it would mean lack of communication by means of words, and it is generally the consequence of a lesion to the parts of the brain responsible for language. Uh, damage to the left hemisphere is going to cause aphasia for most of the right-handed people, indicating that language is lateralized on the left, and over 50% of the left-handed people. There are different reasons why you can have aphasia, and we will get to the definition in a moment. You can have a cerebrovascular accident of ischemic or hemorrhagic nature, an intracranial hemorrhage, bounds and contusions, tumors, brain infarctions, infections, and also uh, degenerative processes such as, for example, dementia. Although in these cases, we will actually talk about primary progressive aphasia more than aphasia. You have here on the pictures the capture of a normal brain in uh, green. You can see the areas, especially the left one, that are supposed to be responsible for production. That would be a Broca's area on the left and its counterpart on the right. And you can see in the tumor, the infarction, and the injury that some of these parts have been affected. But you can also see that these lesions can be very different among themselves. But what is this aphasia? What's this lack of words? Maybe this is the best definition. Acquire language disorder due to focal brain damage. Why is this the best definition? Because it allows us to tell apart what is not aphasia from what it is. It is an acquired language disorder. It means that after language acquisition takes place and it is completed, uh, aphasia may um, emerge. If you have aphasia during the course of acquisition, we are in front of childhood aphasia, something that works differently. It is not congenital, it is not a language acquisition disorder, and it is not childhood aphasia. It is about language. It's an acquired language disorder. So there's no articulation disorder. There might be articulation disorders, but then it is aphasia plus something else. All, and it affects all language modalities. You can see it affecting production, comprehension, but also reading and writing. It is focal. It is not, in general, due to a diffuse uh, injury, such as, for example, uh, the dementia types that uh, we could be considering. And it results of a brain injury. There's no psychogenic language disorder associated, such as, for example, schizophrenia. So acquire language disorder due to focal brain injury. And here you have an example from Serbian uh, from, the, from, uh, the eight, in, from year 88, where you can see that one of the characteristics that we are going to observe are missing materials in production. Depending on your lesion, production or comprehension may be more affected uh, than the other. And here we have a case where production is affected. Mama and daddy know drying dishes I cannot say, I cannot say, look how it's holding, I cannot say. So you see that there is a very fragmentary speech what this participant uh, can uh, produce. So we said that it may cause problems with all or any of the following skills, production, comprehension, reading, writing, and gesturing. But what we will always see is that if we do have problems in production, Comprehension may be almost a, a spur, but there's always some sort of residual damage that it is going across uh, modalities. So when we talk about a production deficit, we may expect some residual comprehension deficit at least. And when we talk about a comprehension deficit, we will expect some production problems, although the main characteristic is, of course, going to be, in the later case, comprehension in the former one, production. We will see that there's a lot of variability across individuals. Remember when we saw these lesions, lesions are very, very different, but brains are also very, very different across, it, across uh, human beings. So there's a variability across the individuals when it comes to the recovery patterns. One fourth of these patterns are going to be recovering in three months, but they will still have a really good prognosis till the sixth month. After that six months, the, the recovery uh, decreases significantly, although there's a still one-fourth of the patients who are severely damaged as a consequence of this lesion. So the recovery patterns are also going to be varying according to the different modalities, all the languages that that uh, speaker uh, wears, uh, uses. Aphasia is going to be related to the amount and also to the location of the damage. So we can kind of predict a little bit based on the lesion what our participant is going uh, to be doing. And we can classify those participants for clinical and for research purposes. If we take the traditional classification from the uh, Boston test of aphasia, we, will, we can see a scale that ranges from zero to five. Zero, total absence of production and comprehension, and five, absence of observable deficits. But if 
we are in a faculty, especially in a humanities faculty, then the most widespread classification that we will be handling is actually in between mild, moderate, and severe participants. The people with aphasia can also suffer from related problems. As we said, it's a language disorder, but we can see speech disorders that are associated uh, to it, like, for example, dysarthria, apraxia, or soloing disorders. So disorders that if you pay a little bit of attention to it, they all do denote a motor component, the motor failure that is associated, and that's due to the proximity in the brain of those areas that control, uh, the, well, those areas implied in the primary motor cortex and those that control full language. We can classify aphasia. We said we have those that are more uh, affecting mode of production, those that are affecting comprehension more, and that's, then fluency is going to be key in our classification. We can talk about eight main syndromes in general. Two are going to be affecting production more than comprehension, and two are going to be affecting comprehension more than production. The first one would be motor aphasia, also known as Broca's aphasia, or transcortical motor aphasia. We have global aphasias and transcortical uh, mixed aphasias. All these uh, four uh, syndromes are going to have a major impact in production. But for example, in the case of global aphasia, we will see that comprehension is severely impaired too, because it's mainly one of the worst lesions that you can have. When it comes to the plus fluency, meaning they talk a lot, but they have problems understanding what they are actually saying, we have sensory aphasia, Bernicke's aphasia uh, is another name for it, transcortical sensory aphasia, conduction aphasia, anatomic aphasia. And what you see is that although fluency is key, differences in comprehension are also used to classify. Not so much repetition and naming, because these are very subject to variability. And here we have the contrast when it comes to the anatomy. I tried to keep the blood to a minimum, but there are some pictures. Uh, in this one, we have actually an example of Broca's aphasia. We will hear how it sounds in English in the next video. But here what we see, and I will have to move and shout a little bit, what we see is that if we start scanning our patient, think about the patient lying, lying like that and having different like, sections, you will see that we can go to quite upper parts of our brain so that we observe the lesion. So we, if we have a look at this picture or the last one over there, we can see on that side that we have a, ma a massive lesion that it's targeted, that it is affecting Broca's uh, area. So how would, how would a patient like this uh, look like? And of course the video is not working because they never do when you have to give a talk. So let's see it from here. Right. Five years. Five years. Yeah. Yeah. Five years. Mm. Uh, uh, and uh, well, uh, 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 drive car, okay, me, me, drive car. So what we can see in this video is a person that has severe problems, uh, right, with, that has severe problems with production. So uh, if we have a, uh, if if we have a look at the lesion, we can see that when we target areas close to Broca's area, and I guess you, uh, you can see it more clear in this slide, when the lesion involves the areas that cross in the middle of uh, these red lines, we will see that comprehension, uh, production is going to be severely impaired. While comprehension is good, what the participant was trying to say in this case is that he had a traumatic brain injury five years ago to a, due to a car accident. So you see that there's a lot of filling in the gap, but the lexical information is still in there. What happens if we move to another area? We were working more or less at this level, and now what we are going to do is we are going to go a little bit backwards and a little bit lower. So we are going to be on the temporal areas. If we want to see the lesion illustrated here, we can no longer depend on this view. We can already start seeing it. 
but the best views of religion are in the upper slides. So you see that we have to go down and back a little bit to find this other area and uh, to see how it would uh, sound uh, a participant that has a, a lesion that is going to affect comprehension more than production. I'm going to ask you some questions, and I just want you to answer yes or no. Okay? Yes or no. Is your name Smith? What are, what are they? What they're eating of them? And I don't know. Right. Is your name Brown? Oh, Mr. Triangle, if I'm looking at walking, those things, things, this, thing here for these. Okay, just say yes or no. Okay, is your name Brown? But it is here, then let me see, I just don't know. Okay. No, I'm not going to eat any if I know. No. Are the lights on in this room? No. <laughs> I just don't Sorry, what you're doing, and you're just sitting walking around and around here. You're doing fine. That's okay, I know it's kind of hard for you, but you're doing fine. Oh. So what you mainly see in this video is that the person doesn't have any problem producing. So just say yes or no, yeah, whatever, blah, 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 blah. So they produce non-stop. But if you actually go to the test, you see that there's no comprehension. Notice this. Uh, are the lights of the room on? She is on the therapy room. So as you can imagine, the lights are always on. And she says, no, 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 and she starts laughing as if it was a funny question. So there's no comprehension. And then if you do pay attention to the syntax, you see that the sentences are not as okay, although prosody is normal, although there's a lot of production, that these sentences are not really grammatical. I just don't sorry what you're doing, and you just saving walking and walking around there is really not an English, uh, a grammatical English sentence. So we see that there are differences depending on where we do get uh, that uh, lesion. So if I manage to go back to my PowerPoint. Okay, so now we more or less have seen what this aphasia thing is. Lack of com uh, problems with communication, targeting production or comprehension mainly uh, that may affect any of the physical, uh, many of the parts involved in the physical substrate for language. But we said this is a multidisciplinary uh, enterprise. And how come it is multidisciplinary? This is more or less what we think nowadays is the organization of the, f of the human brain for language. You see that it covers a wide area of the left hemisphere, but before we got here, there was a bunch of different professionals from different disciplines that actually made observations. And I got a little bit carried out with history, so I'm starting 3,000 years before Christ. I'm gonna go fast, but hey. Here you have the oldest known surgical tre uh, treatise uh, on trauma. You can uh, see it uh, on the internet. It's believed to be a copy of a work dating from uh, 3,000 years before Christ, but it talks about brain, convolution, meninges, cerebrospinal fluid, hemiplegia, but also aphasia. You can see it all, you can unscroll it, you can navigate through it. You have the uh, address here. But here you have case 20, and importantly in case 20, what they report is of that uh, and if you ask what he suffers from and he does not speak to you, so that's a symptom. So you ask your participant and if that participant cannot speak back either because he doesn't understand or because he cannot produce. So it would be kind of the first uh, historical uh, documentation of a language uh, deficit. So for a while, aphasiology and brain lesions were the realm of priests. But if we skip the dark Middle Ages because they are boring and because not much was going on, uh, we can go uh, for uh, two seminal works. We talk about two main lesions, Broca's aphasia and Wernicke's aphasia. So let's see the guys and what they were doing. First we have Paul Broca. He, uh, he was talking about the ability to articulate language as situated in the inferior part of the third frontal gyrus in the left hemisphere. So with the first attempt not to say language is on the brain or related to the brain because a brain lesion can affect language, now we go a step beyond and we say it is on the left, on frontal regions, frontotemporal regions. And he was calling this a femi. 
Another relevant figure would be also uh, Carl Bernicke, sounds and images in the left frontal area, good images in the superior part of the posterior, uh, of the, of the posterior temporal gyrus, and in between these areas, there's this, there is a connecting fiber that connects uh, them both. So we would be in front of the traditional model of what language would be, where we would have on the B, Broca's area, and the W, uh, um, Bernicke's area, and we have the arcuate fasciculus for information to travel from one region to the other. This would be a simplification, but then it, it was for the first time it became the a physiology became the realm of neurologists. It didn't last long because uh, neuroimaging techniques started to uh, appear very very soon. And there are three sets of, of uh, imaging techniques that have been used uh, when approaching uh, aphasia. The first one would be dealing with the surface anatomy, observing the lesion as Broca did once uh, Mr. Le Bourne and Mr. Le Long uh, passed away, their brains were uh, analyzed post-mortem. This would be surface anatomy in vivo, but it's still surface anatomy. We also have sectional anatomy, what we saw when we were illustrating the lesions that allowed us to navigate at different depths and observe different uh, sections. But we also have connectional uh, anatomy. Remember that I said we have Broca's area and Bernicke's area. Broca's area around here, Bernicke's area a little bit lower, and they talk to each other through the arcuate fasciculus. So these connectional pathways is what new neuroimaging techniques are uh, bringing us. So at the beginning, we only had X-ray uh, for uh, computerized uh, axial tomography, so we could only see the anatomy. What's the problem with the anatomy? The problem with the anatomy is that the brain is really hidden, especially in my case. Imagine that you have to test like under like this block of head, and then you have your skin, but then you still have your skull, and under your skull you have your dura, and under your dura you have your brain. So. All these different tissues have different densities, and all these different densities are going to be uh, having an impact on what you see in your image. So anatomical imaging may not be as informative as some other techniques that we have available, and that's when function really came in. So the use of neuroimaging techniques such as fMRI, PET, MEG, or ERPs allows researchers to observe the operative capacity of the brain. Since we don't have time to kind of have a, blink, uh, a glimpse on all of them, we're just going to focus on the movement we did. We moved from anatomy, a picture of where the lesion is, and now we are moving on to function. So we are observing these in vivo brains. We can see what they do at different processes. For example, when I want to read something, I first have to see it. I see it with my occipital lobes. Then I have to understand it. Then if I want to repeat it aloud, I have to codify it somehow and then send it to my muscles so that I can parrot what I just read. And in order to observe all the intermediate uh, stages, we can use some of these neuroimaging techniques. These are the most widely used. Why? Because they are considered non-invasive. We have uh, two that are based on our, uh, on our uh, hemodynamic responses, and two that are based on our electromagnetic responses. So we have uh, PET, positron emi emission tomography, and functional magnetic resonance imaging, the more uh, well-known fMRI, and the hemodynamic techniques. What's the rationale? If I have an area of my brain that it is doing a lot of work, that area is going to be consuming a lot of oxygen, and it's going to be burning a lot of glucose. glucose. So you just follow the, uh, the oxyhemoglobin and see where it is coming back from. And then you see that if all your oxygen is consumed there, you know, if all your glucose, well, not all, but if a lot of glucose is like burned there, it means that that area is working a lot. That's how hemodynamic techniques work. And they are really, really good for um, spatial resolution. So you can really tell what's going on at very, very small areas of the brain. But when it comes to the timing, responses are measured in seconds. And a second for a brain, that's a lifetime. So, really good if you want to know about the location, not so good if you want to know about the temporal resolution. For the temporal resolution, we have the other two guys. We have the EEG, the electroencephalography, and the magnetoencephalography. 
What happens even when we are resting? Our brain is emitting signals, signals that we can capture, waves that we can measure. So this is the, uh, this is the basis for the electromagnetic techniques. You measure different waves that are happening in your brain, both in the rest of state, but also as response of, of linguistic tasks. There you can see very precisely what is happening almost every millisecond, not almost, you can see what's happening at every millisecond, but the uh, spatial resolution, if you want to locate what that's going on, is going to be uh, poorer. So you need to know what you want to see and go for one of the, or the other. I just brought examples of two of these techniques, the most invasive of the non-invasive techniques and the least invasive of the non-invasive techniques. The most invasive, actually now it's considered semi-invasive, is the positron emission tomography, where you actually inject a radionucleotide tied uh, in, the blood, uh, in the blood torrent of your participant and the, due to the same principle, more blood is going to an area that is working, it means that more blood is carrying that uh, radioactive uh, substance into the areas that are working. And you can track the, uh, uh, the gamma ray that uh, this um, radionucleate uh, is emitting so that you can reconstruct pictures. You can see what's happening when you're hearing. You can see what's happening when you're seeing. We can, you can see what's happening when you are thinking. And importantly for us, you can see what's going on when you are speaking. And for those of you, I hope those areas over there at least, who may be a little bit more familiarized with the anatomy, we can say that these correspond quite well with the primary uh, motor a cortex, meaning that for speaking you need to move your muscles, not only to codify the language, and also for the more traditional Broca's Bernicke's compound. So it kind of fits what we had seen uh, traditionally. We can also use EEG, and it's, as you see, it is really non-invasive. There's a lot of EEG done with babies, and they all fall asleep, meaning that doesn't look like torture. Uh, we can uh, record, as you see, uh, different things from ranging from uh, epileptic responses, alpha waves, etc., so that we can see what's going on with our participants. How do we see that? We can have an experiment like the one that we have in here. We have a stimulus, then a break, then another stimulus, then another break, and what we do, we measure what's going on during that stimulus. We measure the waves, it goes to an amplifier, well, the amplifier captures uh, these, uh, these um, waves, and then it makes a mean of that. So you get a mean per stimulus per participant, and the system come up, comes up with something like this graph. What's this graph telling us? First, we see that we have milliseconds here. So it's telling us that we are going to be able to see what's going on at, the, at a very precise time scale. When it comes to the brain, there's a trick. Nothing is what it looks like. In general, left is right, anterior is to the front, where we tend to represent the future, and of course, negativity is in the upper part of the graph, contrary to what all your mathematical teachers have been telling you for years. We would see here, for example, an early left anterior negativity. Early, because it happens very, very soon. We are talking about at most 120 milliseconds. Left, because it happens on the left. Anterior, anterior portions, posterior portions of your brain. So it happens towards the front. Remember, this is EEG, this is electromagnetic. This means that you cannot be more precise when it comes to the anatomy, because you are be, being very precise when it comes to the timing. And N stands for negativity. You tend to report negativity and positivity. That is the peaks that you see in your signal. The M400, for example, is, taken to, uh, is believed to appear when there is a semantic violation, something semantically unexpected. The P600, a positivity at 600 milliseconds, is normally appearing when you have a syntactic error, something like Peter eat apples, where you would expect Peter eats apples, and then by the time that you go through the morphology and you don't pronounce it, your brain says, hey, you're wrong, and then you get your P600 detecting that grammatical violation. So we see that we can observe different phenomena related to language and how our brain responds to that. Here we would have, again, the capture. What we have here is uh, the, go the goose uh, was in the, I can read it from here, but what we have are, uh, is a syntactic violation. 
there's a perception that something is not really working at the very beginning. Sensitivity to the, the to the codifying an early decodifying of that syntax, and then when it comes to making an error, we see that there is a P600 here saying, "Hey, that sentence is wrong." Uh, depending on what we want to see, actually, there's a lot of more neuroimaging techniques, and depending on what we uh, want to see and measure, uh, we can use uh, one of these. So we see the ones that we have mentioned, we see the uh, PET here, the fMRI here, the MEG and the ERP, but you see that we are measuring at the level of the brain. But we could measure at the level of the signals, the dendrite, the neuron, layer, column map, etc. And we can also range, uh, move here from milliseconds to seconds to minutes, hours or days. So it depends on what we want to uh, study nowadays, we have a different uh, techniques that we can use. But then we, we can no longer live only with priests, but we cannot live only with neurologists either, because we really need radiologists to collaborate with us so that we can actually access all these uh, sorts of materials. Now imagine a world where we only have neurologists and radiologists. They should be able to talk together. They come from a clinical background, this terrible faculty of medicine that sounds so scary when you come out of a, of a humanities faculty. But you see that they do speak different languages. And this is the first communication problem that you will observe. It depends on the fact that the paper was written by a radiologist or by a neurologist that you will see deletion in one side or the other. It's not that deletion is going to migrate, but the surgeon is going to be doing his surgery from behind. So if you are lying in front of me, your left hemisphere is my left hemisphere, and your right hemisphere is my right hemisphere. The radiologist sees the patient from the front, so his left hemisphere is the patient's right hemisphere and the other way around. What's the consequence? That if you look at the paper, this is what you're going to see. This is the same participant, only reported by different people. And if you have a look at it, you would say, hey, these are two different lesions. They are not. It's only that they look at the brain in one way and the other. This is only an example, an example of what's going on when you add to this equation cognitive scientists, psychologists, speech and language pathologists, uh, linguists, not to mention biolinguists, anthropologists, and all the rest of the population who can contribute a lot. But we all come from different languages and different backgrounds, and we have to talk together. So maybe the two main challenges that we have to go through are the granularity mismatch problem and the ontological incommensurability problem. What does this mean? We work with different uh, levels of analysis. We saw that we can go from a brain to dendrite. There's kind of a huge difference on that, and from millisecond to day. So a lot of difference on that. How fine-grained our levels of analysis are going to be different, uh, different across um, disciplines. But also, the units of the linguistic computation and the units of neurological computation, it is not only that they are different, it is that they are not translatable nowadays, uh, considering how the current state of affairs is. So, we have here an example. Neuroscience talks about dendrites, spines, neuro cell assemblies, and linguists in general talk about distinctive features, syllable, morpheme, noun phrase. So there's no way we can track arrows from one column to the other. We really need to reach a point of understanding. So what are we in front of? And uh, if we take uh, this kind of pessimistic note in 2005, what we see is that there's inter we can be in front of interdisciplinary cross-fertilization. We are very far from our goal, the goal of everybody talking and working together. Today, the vocabularies of linguists and brain sciences are entirely different, but there's room hope for hope. Remember this slide at the beginning? These were the causes that could generate aphasia. And we have said that they could come from a cerebrovascular accident, any sort of injury, but also tumors. And this is mainly the best example of how you can do multidisciplinary research. This is the case of awake surgery, where uh, if you have a look at here, we have different uh, people involved. This is the surgery room. You have a neuropsychologist here could be a linguist, could be a speech pathologist, just need a linguistic training. You have your participant lying on the bed, the neurosurgeon and people assisting behind that, the anesthesiology and the radiologist uh, to this side. And this is more or less the configuration. So you see that uh, the 
person of the neuropsychologist, uh, speech language pathologist, cognitive science, or the person that is assisting there with the purely uh, linguistic issues is part of the surgery team. What are they doing? Again, I try to keep blood to a minimum. So uh, what they are doing is while the surgeon, you can see him on the upper uh, left, uh, right corner, while the surgeon is uh, stimulating with the Ogeman stimulator, the uh, neuropsychologist, uh, cognitive science, uh, scientist, linguist, speech language pathologist is running a linguistic task so that you can see while your participant is awake, because this surgery is done while the participant is awake, you can see if there's a response to the stimulation of that areas when, those areas when it comes to language. Why do we do that? And uh, let me change to something without blood. Uh, we do that because uh, it was shown that when you uh, undergo surgery and uh, you do it uh, on a, um, on a, under sedation, you cannot really evaluate which are the boundaries of certain regions in your participant. However, if your participant is a good candidate for awake surgery, this is done in low-grade gliomas, which are tumors of a really uh, slow uh, growth, but that will unavoidably uh, mutate and become um, well, and will give trouble, so they have to be resected. But there is a really long uh, hope for uh, life after this surgery. So quality of life becomes really, really important. And when you conduct this procedure awake, and when you test linguistic capacities, you can guarantee with a better percentage of success uh, that your participant is not going to lose the capacity of speaking or the capacity of understanding, which are two crucial things when it comes to recovery and when it comes to the quality of life. Because social interactions are all codified through language, so life without language is kind of a life in, a sol in isolation. Here what you have uh, is uh, one of the tests that have been developed in the, in, uh, the Netherlands uh, in the past uh, two years, mainly with two wonderful thesis dissertations. And they put together the, the Dutch linguistic intraoperative protocol uh, for uh, awake surgery. And here what they did is that they evaluated typical linguistic tasks. And I don't know if you can read it, but uh, you can have action naming, sentence completion, repetition. So really typical uh, linguistic tasks. They observe which functions are involved for those tasks. For example, if you talk about repetition and uh, you, could, you would need the motor network, uh, if you talk about sentence completion, you can talk about language initiation uh, with action naming. Well, naming is naming. Uh, but you can see different processes. And these different processes have some sort of correlate when it comes to the brain. And that would be the first column. So the different colors are going to be illustrating what you have in here. When the surgeon is stimulating one of these areas, we are going to be conducting a linguistic test at the same time, which focuses on the main linguistic characteristics that we expect to find on that area. And like that, we can see what's going on, uh, what's going to be going on once our patient um, uh, recovers from uh, the surgery. So. No matter how we look at it, pen and paper experiments, behavioral experiments, neuroimaging techniques, neuro, uh, neurosurgery, it doesn't matter how we represent it through a glass brain, remember that area over there? That here we cannot say if the lesion is on the right or on the left because our brain is transparent. So we see across it, that's a glass brain. Uh, then we have the inflated brain. Remember that our brain has all these curves, all these valleys and mantes, the sulci and gyri. If we inflate it, we can see what's going on in those valleys that are otherwise hidden for us. And then we have the anatomically correct brain where we have a template on top of which we plot all those areas as for which we found activation. But it doesn't matter what we do. The important thing is that there's room for hope, there's room for disciplinarity and four more studies to be done, and this is what we have actually learned. Remember that at the beginning we said there's Broca and Bernicke talking to each other through the arcuate fasciculus? This is how it would look like nowadays, where we do not only see uh, the traditional left area with a more expanded network for language, but we also see parts such as the putamen when we work with subcortical structures, and we also see portions of the cerebellum that are going to be uh, 
contributing to the language network, not to mention that all these areas have to talk to each other, not to mention all the subcortical pathways that are going to be also operative when it comes to language. For those of you who are curious, this sounds very scary. There's a trick. Uh, remember something like ASTS, for example. So, anterior or posterior, uh, sulcus or uh, gyrus, the lobe in which it is, and uh, no, superior and inferior, the lobe in which it is, and then sulcus and gyrus. So if we go back to that, let's give it a try. What can be the first P? Okay, first P is posterior. The first S. Superior, the T, temporal, temporal and the S. Oh, no, so close. Perfect. So we see that we do not need to remember all the names by heart. We can actually remember how they, what they are codified. But as we said, there is a lot to be done and a lot of room for hope and a lot of room for new students and new strength to uh, do things here. So uh, I'm just going to focus what's with, uh, on what's going on in uh, Serbia very, very briefly so that there's time for discussion. So the impact of language pathologies in linguistic studies has become more and more evident in the last decade. However, studies in, Serbia, in Serbian remain very scarce. Here we have a summary. I'm going to focus on aphasia only, but you see that it is not the only clinical population that has been investigated in Serbia. And these are very basic linguistic studies only. So there is a lot more, uh, and actually some references I couldn't access because my Cyrillic is kind of non-existent, and that made things difficult. But you see that there are also some other populations that have been uh, documented uh, here. Like, for example, a specific language impairment. In this case, we will be talking about kids, or a Down syndrome. Again, kids, but this time with a clear genetic uh, origin. So you see that there are things that have been done here. But also cases that have been reported from here, and there's this very interesting case that, uh, that Favreau mentions where uh, after the age of 34, she moved to Belgrade and began to speak Serbian. She, uh, he is reporting on how do uh, people with aphasia recover when they handle different languages. And this gives me the perfect excuse to actually address you to one of the first uh, recovery studies that were conducted here in Serbia, where you can see that patients uh, with um, aphasia aphasia following a stroke and those patients with post-traumatic language processing deficits are going to show different recovery patterns. And the correlation in between uh, language and cognitive functions is going to be different in different cases. Uh, we also have reports on aphasiology. This was published in 2010 uh, in Belgrade. And we also have assessment tools that have been done in Serbian. For example, we have the bilingual aphasia test by Paradise. We have the Boston diagnostic uh, aphasia examination, the Western aphasia battery. And there are Serbian, uh, there are Serbian versions of both tests, uh, among, uh, among others. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The, and we also have the token test, and interestingly, I wanted to bring this one. It's a simple test to adapt, so it's adapted in many languages. But now they are doing a new version, which is an iPad version that you can uh, just get. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing is that there's this effort on like feeding as many languages as possible. So if you are speakers of a super fancy language that nobody else speaks, talk to me on a brain, or oh, never brain, or oh, never break, and I will brainwash you. That was the thingy. Okay, so we see that we have. Um, different tools that are really used in the clinics, but there's a really huge but, a really huge but that is not only holding for Serbia, it works for Spain and for many other countries where these tests were uh, adapted, and it's that language measures, at least not all, uh, has, uh, have been uh, standardized on the Serbian population. However, um, however, all of, however, all of them are regularly used in a speech and language clinical practice in Serbia, as there are no other measures available. And we can see that batteries of verbal and nonverbal cognitive tests regularly used for server creation is a sentence that you actually see in your methodology. We tested our participant with batteries of verbal and nonverbal cognitive tests regularly used for server creation, which for me could be Mandarin Chinese because it doesn't tell me anything. I don't know what that means. It doesn't really mean much. Like we tested the guys. 
okay, nice. <laughs> okay, so the batteries uh, cover a range of areas and they are comparable with those of the VDA. So it's not that the election was uh, idiosync idiosyncratic. It's not that they are not working. It's not that they, are not, they may not even be better than the originals. The only problem is that we cannot say. We can only trust. And in sciences, trust should have kind of a short legs. Let's put it like that. So in, those, in that sense, I'm not saying that they are not adequate. I'm just saying that we need to prove that they are adequate. So what did we learn about aphasia? This is what we learned so far through all these studies that I told you. Remember, non-fluent aphasias, anterior parts of the brain related to Broca's area, more emphasis on the production deficits. This is what we will see if we have a look at whoop, at any of the references that you have listed by the end of, the, of every slide. Shared utterances, like the ones we read on that first slide in Serbian, lost patterns of intonation, problems with freestanding functional elements, lexical categories better preserved, non -fluent, uh, and individuals with non-fluent aphasia retain sensitivity to the close, uh, close uh, class morphology and subcategorization requirements in comprehension. So we see broken speech, Remem uh, reminding to that telegraphic speech that we tend to uh, read in the old reports, and sensitivity to close class uh, morphology with lexical categories better than the functional categories and uh, with uh, production more severely affected than comprehension. When it comes to the verbs, we see an overuse of infinitives, problems with inflection, especially tense, especially past tense, tendency to substitute for the presence, Thematic role assignment is, has been found to be problematic. Verbs like the branch broke has been found to be more problematic than mm, the uh, non praise, for example. So we see that there's a sensitivity to certain very subtle linguistic distinctions. That's when uh, uh, the linguists come in that have an impact on the speech of this population. And we have a very, 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 very modest effort that we did here. And I'm happy to have my co-author in the audience. We did a very small, modest review on work that has already been done by professionals here, meaning that if you want to do these things, you just need a little bit of energy and a lot of optimism. But there are things to be uh, done. So apart from this review on verbs, uh, we can also observe what's going on at the sentence level and see that uh, linguistic uh, knowledge is less accessible in context with heavy demands, so processing impaired. We also see that if we invert our sentences, if we use non-canonical constructions, we do generate more problems. We see sensitivity to violations of nouns, determiners, adjectives, uh, also problems with traces or WH. So what we see is that when it comes to non-fluent aphasias, even in a language such as Serbian, which is within the group of uh, not really well explored languages, only English is, so all the rest of the languages go to that group. So we see that we do have detail, that we do have fine-grained detail and that we can predict what's going on with our participants and more importantly, we can put that into practice because remember, this is a clinical population. The whole entire story is about how can I help? Like science comes, first, comes second in this kind of uh, sort of context. So we do have tools uh, to try to come up with good uh, treatments. And that was for the non-fluent, for the ones that have problems speaking. How, what's going on with the fluent? As in any other language, they are the ones that are ignored because they talk so much that analyzing such a bulk of data is really a pain in the neck. So everybody wants to work with those that only say two words. You analyze in two minutes. But we do have uh, a evidence of what's going on with fluent aphasia. So we see that the speakers have difficulty with production of verb forms, as with the non-fluent one, even if these guys are supposed to have more, pro more problems with comprehension, there's production issues going on. Correct time reference through a misselected verb form. For example, instead of saying, I have gone, if I have a broke as aphasia, I won't say I have gone, I say I, I go. And if I have a fluent aphasia, I say I went, meaning that I know it's past, but I don't really know which one, so I just go for the first one that I can. And if I have a broke as aphasia, I don't even know it's past, and the present is so much easier than I just go for present. Contrary to English, there's data that shows that uh, uh, depending on the languages, we may observe some patterns of another, and that gives like license us to actually go and see what's going on at different uh, languages. 
and uh, uh, the, maybe the same whole uh, message uh, is that first, if you want to work with aphasia, it is a multidisciplinary effort. You see that we need different uh, professionals. We need to create, and I want to orient you towards the discussion session that we will have in the round table, we need to create diversified research groups and we need cir circulation of staff and ideas. And although it's really, really bad to say that when you are me in this case, that's all about you. That's all about the students that just finished, that you have all the energy, all the ideas, and all the strength that it takes to kind of like put yourself on that load on your back and work with something uh, like aphasia. And that would be it. Thank you very much. I guess we have time for questions, but I don't only want questions, I want criticisms. Hey, it's the first time that you get an invitation like that, so I hope you use it. Comments, questions, criticisms, curiosities? Oh, don't tell me that I did it so good that I just solve all your doubts. That cannot be true. <laughs> or I did it so bad that you couldn't follow anything. Hmm? That could be true. <laughs> no? Okay, so thank you very much. And if you just want to like, ask anything else during, the, during any break, I'm going to be around for the whole day. Thank you. Well, thank you, Celia. Um, I just wanted to add another thing. I was a very bad announcer in the, when I announced uh, this uh, presentation and this talk uh, because I forgot to say a couple of words about Sylvia, which I will read now. If you <laughs> do, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So Silvia Martinez Ferreiro is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Barcelona. She graduated in English philology by the University of Santiago de Compostela and finished her PhD in cognitive science at the University uh, Universitat Autonoma of Barcelona in 2010. Ever since the beginning of her MA studies, her research has focused on clinical linguistics, mostly on the characterization of aphasic, aphasic systems in language from the Ibero-Romance group. She is currently a postdoc fellow at the University of Barcelona, and she is also tightly collaborating with the University of Groningen and our university, or our faculty. So I just had to do this because I would feel very bad if I hadn't done this. <laughs> okay, thank you, and uh, I hope that you will enjoy uh, today's day, the celebration of... Uh, the, the birthday of the faculty. Um, also, if you have any kind of questions or if you feel inspired by the by Sylvia's talk, you can. I'm sure you can email her and contact her for further uh, information. If you're a little bit shy for today or you just need uh, your thoughts to to come tomorrow. Or, yeah. Thank you.